Thank you. Okay, thank you, Colleen. Um, and I'd like to, uh, sorry, introduce myself, Tony Pearce. I'm Victoria's Inspector General for Emergency Management. I'd like to welcome everybody this morning to Victoria's Emergency Management Inclusion and Diversity Group International Day for People with Disability event titled Working Towards an Accessible Emergency Management Sector for All. Um, we've automatically muted, you'll notice on your screens, all attendees' microphones, and we've turned the videos off. And so if you could just do us a favour and please keep them off for the duration of the event, that would be terrific. So that only our guest panellists and our fantastic Auslan interpreters appear on screen to enable lip reading. And you'll also notice that the Auslan interpreters will be pinned at the top of the screen and the event will be live captioned, so you'll be able to follow that as well. Before going any further, I'd, uh, on behalf of all of our panellists, like to start um, by uh, acknowledging the traditional custodians of the lands or the various lands on which we gather today and pay my respects to their elders past and present and those emerging. And I expect, uh, sorry, extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders people that we have with us here today in the forum. Um, International Day of People with Disability, which is actually on the 3rd of December, aims to increase public awareness, understanding and acceptance of people with disabilities and celebrate their achievements and contributions. Whether you produce public information or you're a frontline responder or you perform another role within our sector, every interaction with our communities obviously matters and it's critical. Our panellists are going to provide insights from their own lived experiences today about how the effects of emergencies can disproportionately impact people living with a disability and provide us with some practical steps and uh, to implement as a sector and as individuals to uh, improve disability inclusion practice, strengthen-based approaches and respectful engagement, which is obviously very, very important. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our facilitator and panellists. Um, and facilitating today's event, it gives me, gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Colleen Ferlinetto, a, uh, sorry, OAM. Colleen's a current Ambulance Victoria board member, a CFA volunteer and Vic SES associate member and former Commercial Passenger Vehicles Victoria Disability Commissioner, so has a huge amount of experience in this space. Colleen holds multiple disability portfolios and committee roles regarding safety and inclusion for Victorians with a disability. Currently, she's on a board member of the Disability Worker Registration Board Victoria and a council member of the Victorian NDIS Community Advisory Council. Colleen is a person with a disability and identifies as a woman. However, as she says, she doesn't believe that either of these identities define her. Now to our panellists. Um, I'd first like to introduce and welcome Morris Gleeson, OAM, who is President of Blind Sports and Recreation Victoria. Morris has been the president of that organisation now for some 30 years and leads a team who plan and implement more than 30 blind sport and recreation programs for the vision impaired. Um, as a member of the City of Melbourne Disability Advisory Committee, he advocates for improvements in access, community programs and participation, as well as legislative change for people with vision loss. Our second panellist today is Nazim Erdem, OAM, practice leader from AQA Victoria. Nazim sustained a spinal cord injury in 1990 after diving into shallow water and breaking his neck, a story we've heard many times throughout Victoria. He's represented Australia at five Paralympic Games in wheelchair rugby, competed in three Target Tasmania rally events, and was the first quadriplegic to fly solo. That's pretty gutsy stuff, Nazim. Nazim's work focuses on providing peer support to people with spinal cord injuries, motivating and encouraging his peers to reach their potential. Our third panelist is Shanley Meldrum, who's a section leader with the events and presentation, uh, sorry, section leader events and presentations with Victoria State Emergency Service uh, at the Gisborne SES unit. Shan Lee is currently working as a project manager at Deaf Hub Bendigo and is a passionate advocate for the deaf and hard of hearing community. And last but by no means least, I'd like to introduce Jim Mullen, CEO of Amaze. Earlier this year, Jim was appointed the new CEO of Amaze, a highly experienced CEO from the social sector. Jim has led autistic staff in several settings. Jim also has a personal connection and understanding with autism from supporting a family member who lives with autism themselves. So now, without any more from me, I'd like to hand you over to, to Colleen to uh, facilitate the rest of the program. Thank you, Tony. Welcome, everyone. Our conversation today, I'm sure, will offer insights and possibilities to build on inclusive, accessible communication for people with disability in your organisation. Many other aspects of disability inclusivity and accessible practices could be discussed, but we would not do them justice in just this hour. Communication and engagement cover a wide range of activities, which even without the emergency event pressures, we see too often the exclusion of information for people with disability in everyday life. So when we need it most, we must consider and include people with disability in our community and in our emergency sector operations to assist in the access lens that is required. 
Accessible communication prior, during and after emergency must include diversity according to the setting as a forethought, not an afterthought. Every interaction matters and respect and dignity is vital. Remember, diversity is a fact, inclusion is a choice. Please consider one in five people have a disability. I share this quote by David Masters from Microsoft. If you don't design for accessibility, it's like saying to every fifth person who walks in the door, I don't want your business. I will now pose some questions to the panel. I ask you to use the Q&A box during the session, which we will answer as many as possible and will follow up with any unanswered, post the event, along with some helpful tools and information for you to consider regarding accessibility in your organisation. At the conclusion of the panel questions, I'll post some of your questions to them in the final moments of our brief session today. Morris, I would like to pose the first question to you and then Naz, if you have anything to follow, that would be great. We have it uh, all at some point in our lives interacted with the emergency management sector, whether it be directly during a personal emergency or part of the Victorian community during large scale emergencies. Can you share an experience from your life about interacting with the emergency management sector and some of the challenges you encountered, particularly in relation to access to emergency communications and information? Thank you, Morris. Right. Uh, thanks, Colleen. Um, yeah, I guess my own personal experience as a person who totally blind uh, was through a storm. Uh, I previously um, lived in Wood End and we had this horrific storm came and I was on my own at the time and there was a lot of rain and deluge pouring down and it was started to uh, enter into a part of my house one of the real challenges is not being able to see and judge how severe the damage is, what potential is. So I did contact the, uh, the SES and they were, it was a very positive outcome, but it was also prior to that is that uncertainty of, of what to do to make that judgment, how severe it was. A high anxiety if you allowed it to be, but it was um, got me thinking about how, how important it is to have access to information and to be informed. Great insight there, Morris. Thank you. Now, do you have anything you wanted to add, perhaps a personal experience for yourself or? It was more like a, I really haven't had a personal experience, but, you know, I've been quite anxious at some times and really fearful, you know, especially like uh, laying in bed, for example, uh, about a week ago, we had those high winds and I felt, I thought the uh, the roof was going to come off and it was the worst, um, the, the worst wind I've sort of ever heard. And, you know, it wasn't for half an hour or anything like that, went for hours. And I, I actually couldn't sleep, so I was pretty anxious that night, thinking, what, what do I need to do if something does happen? And it just got me thinking about, okay, we know uh, about SES and emergency services, but we really don't know how to act, you know? I mean, our first action would probably be calling triple O, um, you know, jumping out of bed for me, you know, for and other people with physical disabilities. It's not like a 10 minute process, you know, it takes, it takes like a, a minute or two to jump out of bed. And that's if you're uh, trying to beat your personal best time. So that caused me uh, some anxiety and uh, just thought about, you know, what others would do in this situation. Uh, I thought if things did go wrong, lucky I had my mobile phone uh, accessible to me, you know, I mean, there's sometimes where I haven't, you know, I've gone to bed, for example, and I haven't had my phone. So if anything happened during that time, it just made me think about, I'd, I'd be in real trouble here, you know, because I'd have to just wait and see if anyone sort of realised that I may be in trouble. So that caused some anxiety and some fear as well. But lucky, I think, you know, we all need to have a plan in case something like that does happen. What is the plan? What options do we have? Um, you know, for me, that got me thinking about, I need to have my mobile phone with me around the clock. And, uh, you know, there's been times, like I said before, I have forgotten my phone 
on my desk, for example, and I thought, oh, it's too much trouble to get out of bed and grab it and, uh, you know, I, I should be okay. I sh shouldn't need it that night. But it's one of those things, you know, for example, no one thinks they're going to have an accident. You know, it always happens to someone else. And this is a similar situation, I think. You know, people need to think about it could happen to me. So I need to put things in place where uh, if I need to contact someone, well, I need to do something. I can. I need to have uh, those things around me. Thank you, Naz. And you point very clearly in, um, and so did you, Morris, around the need to be thinking about having access to that pre and event um, planning and those things to think about because in the eye of the storm, so to speak, um, it can be very, very challenging. And the diversity of that communication is essential because we're all individuals. I'll now move to uh, question two. Um, and Jim? I'll um, throw to you first, if that's okay. Um, how would you like the emergency management sector to engage and partner with people living with a disability before, during and after emergencies for meaningful interactions and more inclusive emergency management practice, like community events, forums, um, and uh, with a person-centred planning approach, as, as we've touched on in the first question. How should emergency management workers and volunteers seek and ask for advice around needs that is strength-based? So focusing on the positives that people have also have a, cho a choice to live where they choose um, to ensure that we um, treat people with respect and dignity in emergencies and help people prepare. Your thoughts, Jim? Well, perhaps not unsurprisingly, um, and, and maintaining the theme of, of today's conversation, um, the, the connection and communication is the most important element of this. I would have said that for an organised... You know, the emergency management services in this country are incredibly well regarded. And so building on that regard to engage with communities is, would seem like the, the kind of logical first step beginning to think beyond that simple engagement piece. Um, I, I, think, um, I think elements around considering how the, manage, the management services would begin to develop things like social scripts. You know, the, understanding how to behave in a particular environment is incredibly challenging for all of us. But for many of our, our disabled communities, it's even more significantly challenging. And, and one of the things that, 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 without punting my day job, one of the things we've done as part of the COVID response is we've produced social scripts in 14 languages for every kind of setting, for every kind of vaccination, allowing people before they step into that experience to understand exactly what's going to happen and the process that they're going to move through to begin to allay their fears and, and allow them to engage. I don't think, it, and, and I, I, take, I understand completely that the range of scenario are much, much more significant across the entire emergency services, but it cannot be beyond the wit of man to think about how plain English diagrammatic um, um, templates could be developed which would allow people with a disability to understand what is likely to happen, how people are likely to respond, and, um, and what their engagement with that process should begin to look like and feel like, even though it's a highly stressed environment. I think the third part of the first part of your question, Colleen, is no one in the world can teach the emergency management services about debriefing. No one. This is core skill, core element for, for our management services and therefore the revisitation after an event with people to debrief that process, to walk through the, the reasons why particular actions were taken in a particular time and the responses were shaped and the way that they were shaped and learning through that process. I think is, is a, a critical element of that. Now that all sounds very simplistic when you say it quickly, but the reality is those three steps would begin to move the dial really quite significantly. As far as building prior knowledge and, and developing the, the, allowing the services to develop strength-based approaches, 
The reality is that, that there are any number of great organizations in this state who will help you to develop training, which develops and breeds greater understanding before the event happens of, of what is happening for um, our disabled community when they find themselves in extremists. Um, I'm, I'm going to use my, this is, this is my tried and tested, but it, it, it illustrates the point. Autistic people and engage in an activity called stimming. Stimming is a repeated physical action, which is a means of emotional regulation. When that's viewed by other people who don't understand it, I've seen it as interpreted as everything from fitting to being completely out of control, none of which is true. All that's happening is that individual is helping to manage the stress level within that setting. They can be communicated in exactly the same way as they would at any other time but it is a physical ref manifestation of the stress that they are currently under. They are not out of control. And so just that simple insight working with autistic community and people with other neurodevelopmental disorders for whom this is, this is a practice is a key insight in helping to manage this. And, and I would say to the entire audience, the next time you're physically in a meeting with colleagues, just think about this. The person who's tapping their finger or the person who's tapping their toes or the person who's playing with a phone or the person who's doodling on a paper, your first instinct if there was a fire alarm wouldn't be to dive on top of that person. They're just emotionally regulating in this, exactly the same way as an autistic person would. And so building that kind of understanding and building that insight is the key to a better response and a strength-based response. I'd be having trouble with the mute. You think after two years we'd have it down pat? Um, thank you, Jim. That was really insightful, and I think to to just um, capture um, our individual attitudes, community attitudes, our own um, unconscious bias. Also knowing, as someone living with a disability, and I'm sure others may agree, the very conscious bias um, that exists, um, I think that we need to remember that our emergency services are people first and they have their own attitudes and their own um, place where they're at in their lives. And um, we need to bring everybody along on the journey um, and we need to realise that we're all at different places and spaces. There was some work done around community attitudes and people with disability and 78% of the respondents in this Melbourne University survey said that they don't interact with people with disability because they don't know how or they're afraid of saying the wrong thing. Conversation, ask, ask, ask. Um, Shanley, I wonder if there was anything you'd like to add. I definitely agree. I think um, consultation is the most important thing. And there has been consultation in the past on a national and a state scale, particularly with the deaf and hard of hearing community. Um, there's sort of two designated websites with Auslan accessible information and captions as well. Um, unfortunately, upon reviewing them, a lot of these videos aren't available anymore. Um, I definitely think that they could have been better utilised, integrating them into emergency services websites. They weren't sort of put into the state emergency service or Ambulance Vic or any of those websites that people will be going to in the instance of an emergency. So I definitely think there's a lot more work that needs to be done in terms of accessibility for information in both Auslan and captions. Um, the other thing as well is there definitely needs to be more done in preparation for emergencies. At the moment, you've got your Vic Emergency app. If that information is only available in English, how do, you know, native deaf signing people access that information if English is their second language? Um, so I definitely think there needs to be, you know, more resources available so that people can prepare a lot better for emergencies, whereas... I feel like at the moment, there's a lot of focus in the recovery from emergency. So you have a big event like a bushfire or an earthquake, and then that's when the consultation's happening on how do we do things better? But 
there's not a lot happening after that point, if you know what I mean. So another important point is contacting triple zero. A lot of deaf and hard of hearing people don't actually know how to do it, what questions a call taker is going to ask them so they can prepare for that. Um, there is no Auslan resources on how they do that. Um, triple zero calls are prioritised through the National Relay Service, but they're not prioritised for people who use video remote interpreting, so Auslan users. So there is a gap there. You also need um, the internet in order to go through the NRS on a mobile phone. Um, TTY was an option, but that's basically as common as, as pay phones within the deaf community nowadays, so they're very outdated. Um, I think looking at other options in terms of, you know, tech services like they have over in the UK and the United States where, you know, they've got that direct line of communication, but also knowing, you know, what questions they're going to be asked um, in video so they are prepared to give that information, I think will make the process a lot quicker. Fabulous insight, Shenley. Um, and, you know, Jim from um, his organisation's view and, and you from um, hearing impaired. Morris, I wonder um, from vision impaired point of view, what do you have to share that, that might be useful? Well, I think what we're going to be very careful of, that we don't just think accessing via internet and websites and that is the primary a resource to use all the time because in the case of an emergency if something drastic and not everybody who is able to access information easily um, they can certainly do it but often the feedback I get from a lot of people is it's laborious it takes a lot longer you're not sure what you're looking for, particularly if you're a screen reader, um, you know, so it's not easily. So I think we all, as well as, sure, we need to have that as a option, but we need prior knowledge, I think, uh, in the case where you're not able to communicate, if something does happen, you know, phone, it's or internet, what are your options? What knowledge do you have before that? Um, so you have to have a backup plan that I think we need to look at, not necessarily now, but I think it's something we need to explore. What are the options where communication is? Because someone, uh, say, um, who's blind or um, has very limited functional vision, the, the communication and mobility are the two main concerns. Uh, they can't just jump in a car and take off. Um, particularly, I'm talking about those who perhaps are living alone or you know, don't have someone that can drive a vehicle. They're the things that I think we need to explore. Absolutely, some great tips there. And we'll draw that out a little bit more um, with our next question, if that's okay. So um, I might start with you, uh, Naz, if I can. Mm -hmm. um, what practical adjustments and solutions could be proactively implemented by the emergency management sector that would increase accessibility for you? Definitely, like, uh, like we were talking about it before, uh, there's so many different disabilities out there. And, uh, you know, that study you mentioned, a lot of people don't interact with people with disabilities because of fear. They don't know what they're going to face. You know, are the, is the person going to be able to reply to them or... You know, get a bit funny. They they just don't know, but it's I think all about being proactive and learning uh, about the major disabilities. Um, you know, because you know, it's also about education. But in saying that too, you can't know or learn about every single condition of every single disability. That's a hard one. So I don't know. I mean, is is the the first step uh, learning about different types of uh, disabilities, as in what conditions each one uh, is affected by. I think that's really important. So education is really good as well. And, uh, you know, there's major organisations that support these various disabilities. Um, educating their members that way, I think, you know, through newsletters or webinars, 
on our, as part of AQA Victoria, we've been doing a lot of webinars online and a lot of people are really interested in every single topic that we talk about and emergency services or um, situations like that can and probably should be a topic where you know we organize a webinar with those different organizations inviting their members to talk about what could go wrong and how you act when that does happen and how to be proactive as well i think that's really important and uh, we talked about choice and control to you know when there's bushfires and people with uh, physical disabilities for example or any anyone with a disability some people might tell them, um, you know, to be safe, don't live there, move into an apartment building in the city and you'll be safer, but that's not choice and control. So you give that person choice and control and encourage them to, to be proactive, you know, see their local fire brigade or whatever and see what they need to do just in case things do go wrong. And they got some great information about, you know, having an emergency pack near the door, for example, you know, that contains, uh, I don't know, spare clothes, um, any medical equipment you might need for the next few days, stuff like that. So about being proactive, I think, is really important. But people need to know what that means as well um, regarding different disabilities. Absolutely. It's, um, and uh, Naz, you and I are both wheelchair users. It's more than uh, wide doorways and ramps. Exactly. Um, there's there's yeah. a lot more. So, um. If I may, Shanley, I'd like to, to um, come to you. There was a question um, uh, posed by um, an attendee today, and it was um, basically aligning that masks during COVID, um, massive challenge, um, and the safety of having the right mask, um, you know, category that's safe to use, not something that's, you know, got your glad wrap out and made a, you know, cut and paste mask. It has to be, you know, safe. Um, how did you find during COVID and um, your, your challenges around um, having everybody masked and not being able to lip read? My mute's playing now. Um, I found it significantly challenging. I would say, you know, as someone who I grew up part of hearing, I'm probably my hearing hasn't deteriorated in the last three years more significantly, but I probably never felt as deaf as I have during this pandemic. Um, and I know that is the, the same for a lot of other hard of hearing people are starting to notice that they're unable to communicate when previously they could being able to lip read. Um, so I definitely think that it has brought that to the forefront, people are a little bit more aware of deaf and hard of hearing people, but in the same sense, a lot of people were very reluctant to work with deaf and hard of hearing people in terms of their access needs, lowering masks and adapting the way in which they communicate. Because I find as a deaf person myself, I'm generally the one that adapts the way in which I communicate. Um, but if that other person you know, is wearing a mask, you can't get around that. Um, and if they're not willing to pull it down, then how do you navigate that? Um, so especially responding as a volunteer during this, one of the most helpful things was the fact that most of my unit knows Auslan um, and they've done deaf awareness training and they're very much aware of how to interact with a deaf or hard of hearing person. So it was second nature to them, but out in the community, I did find it significantly more challenging trying to communicate with people. Um, there's often instances where I don't talk because if I talk, people just automatically assume I can hear, um, even though I'm communicating with them how it's best to communicate with me. So it's definitely affecting a lot more people than it did previously. Thanks, Shanley. Morris, if I could come to you, um, and what would you like to add around the practical adjustments as someone with um, vision impairment and um, what could the sector do to um, increase accessibility for low vision and blind people? Sure. Uh, I think, um, uh, again, uh, it's sort of been touched on before, the education and awareness, because I, I can fully, under well, not fully understand, but I can understand why, if you haven't had experience with a diverse range of disability, um, it is, you know, but it can be awkward because they are um, not sure how to engage or how they feel. 
people and get the experience I've ever had and, and I consider being a privilege in a way. When I lost my sight, I went to the school for the blind. And there they had a whole range of children, young you know, students with diverse range of disability. And being, being a board in school, I learned so much about a whole range of disability. And that was a great life experience for me to be able to gain that experience. Because initially, I felt awkward. I never came across such a diverse range of disability. I wasn't sure. Uh, and so I understand maybe why some people uh, having that experience is a great learning um, journey for many people. So if we have that direct exposure. One of the challenges we had during the uh, pandemic was this mobility because previously, if you're out and about, you, you know, people offered to assist you or you might ask assisting if you need to cross an unfamiliar road or you're looking for a particular item in your shop or something. So that social distancing was an issue. Who you're asking for assisting, that reluctance by both parties um, has created a challenge for many people um, who stopped mobility, they didn't go out as much. So they relied on support workers more. So that's something that we need to, part of the recovery, is how we gain that confidence again, interacting again with people. Um, so that's going to be a bit of a uh, challenge. Um, thank, you. Yeah. Thank, thank you so much, Boris. Okay. That's great. Jim, we have a, a question here in the, in the chat, um, and it's, um, what would be the type of resource work with autistic community to assist a person-centred preparedness in planning? I, I, um, and depend, depending, I, I really um, need to qualify all that I'm about to say by the fact that the breadth of autism means that trying to narrow this conversation to a very specific point is incredibly difficult. But the kind of things that we have found that work is that um, the, our, our community um, are, are, are very active online, are, are work best with when plain English is adhered to in terms of communication that the, the greater the level of detail that can be provided, the, the, the better that it is absorbed and understood because it begins to close down adjacent questions. Um, and the, the practicalities around the development of these plans have to be uh, predicated upon having an, a real insight and understanding into the individual that you're working with. Um, our, um, our experience of, of supporting the development of plans, not just in, in, in this kind of setting, but also in, in, in thinking about educational plans and behaviour support plans around different engagements in different settings that are um, that the, the recognition, and I think you touched on this, Colleen, the recognition also has to be made that whilst we're working to support people to develop an understanding of how they might respond or how they should act to protect themselves in a particular instance is moderated by the fact that um, their level of understanding of their needs will probably not be matched by the level of understanding of the people who are responding to them in that setting. And therefore, making that explicit and making that, that clear um, and beginning to channel, try to channel the conversation towards a common ground. It is, um, it, it is incredibly difficult, but the, the, the kind of key fundamentals around this kind of plan would always be about as much detail as possible, as much structure as possible, done in, in, in plain English, um, jargon-free, um, and, and the opportunity in the development of these plans to have the to have a communication with the person so that their um, their understanding 
of the situation can be tested, but also that their their preference and their autonomy is is not undermined by someone parachuting in paternalistically and dropping a plan on them. So it's it's a it's a very very it's a very very human engagement. It is very very specific. The the interesting elements of this, however, are that for lots of members of our community, if, if you can provide a basic structure for a plan like this, our community are really very, very capable and able of populating those areas themselves so that there is that they develop their own plan based upon a framework that you create and that they own it. And so for a whole series of reasons, um, thinking about this, it is about, it is about, it has less to do with um, the, the immediate content than it has to do with the framework and the setting within which the plan is developed. And, and that, I think, has been our experience of the best way to, to begin to think about um, how these plans are developed in a whole range of settings and, and, and beyond an, an emergency response setting. Thank you. Some just some um, really valid points, and again, this is just touching on the conversation. And there have been, you know, similar conversations happening for a while. We've had some chat around what um, current policies and plans um, exist around. And I think for me, I'm finding that there is some inconsistency across the emergency management sector in the messaging around preparation, even and um, you know, during an event and after. So. I wonder how important it is for you, Morris, to for there to be um, with your community around the consistency of the information, whether it be a pandemic or a bushfire or a or a um, or, or we're involved, you know, a smaller event that is more, um, you know, like a traffic accident or, or something of this nature. About how emergency management can, what's what tools could they be building to be able to ensure connecting to you in, in whatever event that is? Well, look, I think it's critical that it is consistency. You know, you know I, I think it's really important that it, it's in plain English, but it needs to be consistent because you don't want to get conflicting information because that doesn't help anyone. Anyway. You, uh, you, you become confused which way you ought to go. So having a, a simple access to information whatever format that would be, um, and, and to invite people to engage with it, you know, invite people to find out, to become proactive, because people are not necessarily going to think, oh, look, I'll contact them and find out what they do. They don't. But if they're encouraged to make connection with them to what works for them, as um, we previously indicated, Everyone is unique uh, and same for people with disability. So if they know they can actually be proactive and contact certain services um, would be great. And even to know what services, emergency services are out there, because you might just know your triple O and SES, but it could be a whole lot of other ones there. So how do you find out where these services are would be good too. Thank you, Morris. Um, again, some great points. And I think um, recently uh, in October this year, the NGOs Quality and Safeguards Commission um, uh, signed a, a legislative amendment, um, which took effect, I think, um, mid-November. Um, and it was a, that all providers um, must ensure continuity of supports um, that are critical to safety, health, um, and wellbeing of NDIS participants before and during and after a fire. That's a significant, a significant um, uh, you know, uh, amendment, but I'm not sure that even as people with disability on the scheme that would know that that is there um, in developing their plans and preparation, et cetera. So we need to be making sure that we don't assume that people know. And we also need to be mindful, as we all know, not everybody with a disability has an NDIS plan. There are many, many more that don't. A million or so more <laughs> um, of uh, Victorians. Yes, Morris? Uh, absolutely. And I think we've got to keep in mind 
we work in a sector, we're involved in a sector, so we have a passion for advocacy. But the majority of people are not like that. You know, they, they have their own. Oh, we're losing you there, Morris. Um, they're not aiming at looking up policies uh, and, they're, and they're not interested in policy. But what they are interested in, in the practical outcome, what is there? Like a indicator, the amendment. So we, we would come across that. But the majority of our people with disability, uh, everyday person, is not going to go looking for them. Yeah. So that's why we've got to make sure that end result reaches the people. Yeah. In, in a very simple way. But you know, we often think because that's what we're we're all here today because we sort of have a lifetime or being involved. But yeah. uh, the same when we have uh, events or activity, the people who participate in they don't want to find it how it came, how it comes about. They just want to enjoy the activity itself. Yeah, that's right. Thank you, Morris. Yeah. And I think too, I should mention that um, our state. Um, Department of uh, Family Fairness um, at, at uh, here in Victoria. Um, I think it was sometime this year. I don't have the date in front of me, but it was around um, uh, social services um, sector emergency management policy um, protects Victorians' health and safety along the lines of the NDIS, um, I suppose. Um, but about how to plan and prepare and making sure that um, continuity of supports by um, state funded support. So um, I think this is a significant step forward for us in Victoria, um, but we need to, um, that's where communication, we can talk about the nuts and bolts and some people are talking about funding, how do we make things happen? But we've spoken about plain English today. And if we present every piece of information to the community in plain English, then most in our community without much adjustment will be able to, you know, supported by the other other tools that are there, would understand the, the, the context of what's being shared. But we like to complicate things and we can, and we do confuse things. And I think that here's a huge opportunity. I know Emergency Management Victoria is working very hard on this and, I, and here we are today and it's a great opportunity. There are lots of great organisations doing work aside to emergency management that connects and we need to keep that going. But communication is key. Um, I just wanted to touch, if I could, please, um, on uh, people with disability being an untapped resource. Um, you, you know, sometimes we're thought as, um, you know, we're, and we're such individuals and we can have good days, bad days, just like everyone else, but... Um, Naz, if I could just briefly go to you and then I'll, I'll, I'll actually get just some comments from all of you, if that's all right, um, around um, the value around people with disability being a resource and the role that we can play supporting our community um, as people with disability in communicating and how important that would be. Uh, definitely, Colin. Uh, thanks for that. So, I mean, we know each other better than anyone else would know us. So... Uh, it, it's really good. I mean, uh, it's an untapped resource, or, um, or I hope it's not, but I know in the area of research, as in, you know, uh, I'm talking about spine research and other conditions as well, uh, the scientists, or in the past years, the scientists used to assume what is important for people with disabilities and, you know, create a research paper or, or a study based on, you know, their thoughts. And now what they're doing is actually they're having the people with disabilities part of the discussion before the research even starts, you know. Uh, that's really important. And uh, I'd, I'd love to see things go that way. So whenever policies and uh, other things are being made, processes, you have uh, the person with the disability involved, uh, not assuming that you know what their needs are, uh, you know, Many of us can communicate exactly what we, we would need in certain situations, what would be helpful and what wouldn't. Uh, so it's a, it's a better way of making everything efficient, not using um, uh, things, uh, resources that really don't matter or processes that really won't matter. So 
really need to communicate and work with the people with the disability to work uh, to make sure what your thoughts and what you're thinking about doing is correct and worthwhile. Thanks, Nez. Um, Shanley, could I come to you? What would you like to share here? Um, I definitely think consultation at all levels is so important, um, not just from a sector level, but down to a local level. And I've been doing a lot of work with our SES unit on a local level, not just with the deaf and hard of hearing community, but discussions with the blind and low vision community about accessibility to images on our unit Facebook pages and things like that. And I think it's important to note that it's so diverse, no matter what disability you live with, um, especially for deaf and hard of hearing people, we have an array of different communication methods and one, one, one size won't fit all essentially. So I think it's important that, you know, even the local units go out there and, and reach out to the people living with disability in their community and talk to them because I work in a community with a lot of rural and regional people and the way they communicate is completely different to the way people in Melbourne communicate. So I think talking to people living with disability, learning what the barriers are and trying to come up with strategies at all levels in terms of how to approach them. Thank you, Shanley. Great, great points there. Um, Morris? Like I would like, I think we need to have, uh, unfortunately, a lot of people uh, think pe uh, people with disability are either client or consumer, where I see them as consulting. I see that they should be looked as a resource to consult with, and they should be viewed as consulting, not as a consumer or a client, because they have all the experience and knowledge and that, and I think we need to have that mindset change a lot. So when you're engaging with people, you're engaging with the mind that you're engaging with consulting and not as a consumer or, or a client. Yeah, great points there. I feel very strongly about that myself too, Morris. Thank you. Jim, do you have anything you... I see that you're answering a question um, there in the chat box. Thank you for that. Not at um, all. Listen, that, that, Colleen, there's <sighs> lockdown and COVID, I think has created the opportunity for a technological epiphany for the disabled community. Yes. The reality is that we are all engaging with each other on this basis and are very comfortable and very, very familiar with it. And therefore, in both socially, educationally, economically, the this um, our familiarity with the the IT and with this kind of platform, I think, is going to lead to a completely different level of engagement across the broadest range of disabled people. Because um, one of the things I know of of COVID is I'm going to fly less, which means I'm going to do more of this which means that a whole range of my colleagues are all making exactly the same decision. And this platform has and it has an equity about it with respect to engagement and participation. And I think if there's going to be any benefit that flows in the long term out of what we've gone through over the past couple of years, it's going to be that. And I think that the disabled community are incredibly well placed. To, to take advantage of that and to engage with the wider world on a very, very different basis. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Um, you know, prior to the pandemic, it was said, oh, it's too hard to set up this technology. It's too costly. Well, guess what? It, um, it has meant that people can be connected that would have never before, as you say, um, Jim. And I think let's, whatever our normal moving forward will be, um, this kind of connection and other must not get lost because it's created such a massive opportunity. And I think that means that people with disability need to have days like this for us to ensure that we can communicate the opportunities that are there and the resources that we have before us um, and tap into us. Um, and I think that that's really important. We've covered most of the questions um, through sort of through the, the chat. Um, I just wonder, there's a particular question here, Morris and Naz. Um, someone's asking, during an emergency, 
how would you like emergency management personnel to ask you about what level of assistance you might require? So I'll go to you first, Naz. I think that's really important. And just thinking about the past, whenever I've called triple zero, for example, um, I feel so much at ease how clear and patient they are. Uh, that's really helpful because I think I'm a fairly calm guy and, you know, try to communicate as clearly as I can. But when a lot of people that are in emergency situations, you know, they're panicking, they're, they aren't thinking straight. So uh, it, it's, it's great if they uh, actually ask what the situation is. I'm, I'm sure they do it. Are you in any any danger? What can we do um, to to help? Asking those proactive uh, questions, knowing how to calm people down, because I can imagine, you know, there, there's people um, when they're calling emergency services, uh, you know, they can't communicate, they can't get their words out. So having, and it's a it's a great skill to be able to calm someone down and ask what is needed in, instead of um, just talking about uh, um, something that really doesn't matter in that situation. So speaking clearly, calming that person down and getting to the point of what needs to be done right now, I think is really important. Thanks, Naz. Great points there. Um, Morris, how would you, you know, during an emergency, how would you like emergency management personnel to um, up, seek from you what you would need? Yeah, look, I think as um, Nez has covered a fair bit of it, I, I agree with it, but I think it's really important to um, for them not to feel shy about asking, A, what disability do you have? What level of support you require? Um, you know, be very upfront, don't feel shy about it. How, how can we best assist you? Um, yeah, what do, we, what do we need to do? Um, so, but... Sometimes people are a bit shy about asking about disability and, you know, and they get itchy and to be up front, just say to them, you know, nothing to feel embarrassed about. Uh, Lost you again. Um, anything which I can get best to assist and up to the person also to, you know, advise them what they, their requirements are. Thank you, Morris. Shen Lee, yourself? I'm thinking more on like a community engagement type level, but basically in any form of advertising, asking if anyone has any accessibility needs. I feel like it's always the people living with disability having to go out there and ask, you know, is this accessible to us? The burden's always on us. Um, if you see that, you can go, oh, hang on a minute. Yep, this is what my access needs are. And I think that is just a small thing that, that makes all the difference. Um, I'm the same as what Maurice was saying. Um, I'm an open book. I'm always happy to answer questions um, about my experiences. And I think people need to not be afraid of doing that because how else are you, you going to learn? Um, how are you going to learn what the appropriate language is to be using um, and all of those things? We're all human. We all make mistakes. And unless we ask these questions, we're not going to know what the answers are. Absolutely. Asking the person is crucial. And I'm sure you know, you'll relate to this is um, I'm a wheelchair user. I may have my husband standing with me and people will direct their questions to my husband. And I'm like, well, and he's like asking how I am. And I'm like, and he's like, well, she's right there. Um, so we've all experienced that from time to time, I'm sure. And, it, you know, we have to have a certain amount of humour in us, don't we, to, to not um, be tearing our hair out when those sort of things happen. But again, it's attitudes and not sure. And we should ask, as we would ask anyone else, what, you know, what, what coffee do you want? You know, you know, what, what, you know, so just communication um, and thinking about, you know, everybody is an individual. There's no one size fits all. We're coming to the end of this fabulous session. Um, I would just like to, um, Tony's going to come in very soon and, and thank you, but I just wanted to thank you so much for sharing um, and I now have your details and um, we're going to make sure that we connect again. So from me, thank you um, and thank Emergency Management Victoria and everyone involved, Parks Vic, um, Bushfire Recovery, um, everyone else was involved. We appreciate the opportunity um, 
that people with disability have a disability every day. But one day a year to, for us to reflect on that is good. Mm. So in closing from me, remember emergencies and disasters don't discriminate. It's therefore so important that the emergency planning and response do not exclude or ignore the rights and interests, needs, and indeed the expertise of people with disability. Thank you for your time and contribution. Let's keep the conversation going post this event. And remember, diversity is a fact, inclusion is a choice. Does your organisation choose inclusion? I'll hand back to you now, Tony. Go on, Colleen. Thanks very much for that. And I think, um, look, it's been an enthralling discussion to listen to, and I'm, uh, I'm just so so happy that I was asked to, uh, to or given the opportunity rather to host this. And I think. We can all agree, I hope, that this really was terrific and informative um, as far as an event goes. It hopefully really does provide some perspective around the issues facing those living with a disability. And, um, you know, Colin and I were talking before, you know, no matter our race, our social standing, our gender, our geographical location or our political persuasion, many of us actually do live with some form of disability or if we don't, we could do in the future. Um, and if that's not the case, many of us have family members who do so. Um, as Colleen said, you know, it doesn't matter what the hazard or otherwise, we are in fact one community. And I think that resonates very nicely with, with um, the whole concept of shared responsibility and working, working as one in our sector. This is another indication of how, how that resonates for us, I think. Our speakers today obviously have provided plenty of opportunity for us to collectively consider how better to take the needs of our community with disabilities into consideration in everything we do. And like so many other areas that we consider in our day-to-day -day work, it's this, you know, this is not only a legal obligation in many areas, but it's also a moral one. And I can honestly say I really am proud to be part of a sector that is um, that is encouraging these sorts of discussions and providing events such as this one today. And I, I congratulate ENV and the broader sector for, for having brought this all together in such a way. And hopefully, as Colleen said, we can continue these discussions. It's not a one-off. Um, in closing, very quickly, I'd just like to thank Nazim, Morris, Shanley and Jim for the insights that they've all provided today. I think very different perspectives on a, on a common theme. So thanks so much for your time and for your input to that. And of course, to Colleen for her excellent facilitation and to our wonderful Auslan interpreters for supporting the event in which uh, in the way that you have. Thanks for being pinned up the top there. Always amazing to watch what you do. Um, in closing, I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day. Take care and cheers. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.